Check out my scanning electron microscope collection. This is the SEM that I built myself a couple years ago, but the newest addition is this JEOL JSM T200. This was sent to me by Richard Anderson, who rescued it from his university's trash heap, and offered to send it to me if I paid for shipping from Sweden, which I thought was a great deal. So in this video today, I'm going to talk about how I'm getting digital images off this uh, piece of equipment and into videos. Also, if you're interested in supporting the channel, uh, I've got a t-shirt design on teespring.com, and I'll put a link in the description. And it's uh, 14 bucks for a quality t-shirt, you've got the logo on the front and applied science on the back. So uh, go ahead and pick up one of those if you're interested. Before the crate left Sweden, someone, maybe FedEx, dropped it on its back. And surprisingly, the force was high enough where it actually knocked the socket connector off the back of the CRT inside here. Uh, even more surprisingly, just replacing the connector and then refilling the pump with some oil was all that it took to bring this up to fully functional status. So currently, we're looking at a MEMS gyroscope. And as you can see, we're live here. We can zoom in and out and pan around like this. And the state-of-the-art image capture technology at the time was this Polaroid camera adapter. So you'd actually put a film camera here and then set up the scope to do one single frame exposure while the camera shutter was open. However, there's another reason why using a camera will give you a better image than just looking at it on the CRT. The electron microscope works by focusing a beam of electrons down onto the sample and then measuring the amount of uh, emitted electrons coming back from that point. So the signal is very small. Just for argument's sake, let's say that when the beam is over this part of the sample, we're only getting one electron per second. And over here, we're getting two electrons per second. Now we want to amplify this signal into something we can actually see in an image. However, uh, no matter how good our amplifier is, this is going to make a pretty terrible looking image because there's so few gradations. In fact, there's only three values, zero, one, or two. And we could multiply that by a million and then we'd have 0, 1 million, and 2 million, and the image would look basically the same. This problem is referred to as shot noise, and it stems from the fact that the electrons have a discrete charge, and once we've counted them, we can't really amplify the signal anymore because we've already counted all the electrons that we have. In the real world, the amplifier adds its own kind of noise, and there's also other signal problems too. But this is a fundamental problem that the best technology cannot get around. So if the sample is only emitting two electrons per second and we're capturing all of them, all two of them, and we're amplifying them as best as we can, what else can we do to get more signal? Well, we could just shoot more electrons at the sample. Uh, if we just dump more electrons in, we'll get more electrons out. However, the problem is that electrons are like charged and they repel each other. So if we have more electrons in the beam, the beam will necessarily be fatter. At low magnifications, this isn't a problem. But at high magnifications, we really need this beam to be as tightly focused as possible to get a good image. So alternatively, we could put more energy into each photon. So we're not actually adding more photon, or we're not adding more electrons, but we are making them go faster. And this is the, you know, the kilovolt acceleration value that you'll see on lots of scanning electron microscope micrographs. However, this has a limit as well. Eventually, the electrons will have so much energy that they'll be buried deep into the sample and we actually won't get any more of this signal coming out. The realistic upper end is about 30 kilovolts, and any faster than that, the electrons don't actually give us much more information about the surface of the sample. So we're running out of tricks, but there is something else we can do. We can actually slow down the speed at which we scan the beam along the sample. So if we're only getting two electrons per second here, if we stayed over that spot for a good 10 seconds, we might find out that we collected a total of 21 electrons. And if we uh, move to the next value, whereas before we collected nothing in one second, we might collect four electrons sitting there for 10 seconds. So what we've done is we've sort of traded our poor signal collection ability uh, for, with time. So we're spending more time and getting a better signal. All scanning electron microscopes, including the latest cutting edge models, uh, have to get around this problem of dealing with low signal. So when we're zoomed in like this, uh, we're in video mode now, which is kind of like a low resolution, fast scan rate. And this is so that we can move around and get the image set up and focus it. And then to actually take an image, we slow down the scan rate to something very low. In fact, it's, it's too low to even see the image. It's just a, a line that's tracing down. However, if we had a camera with its shutter open, or if we had a digital acquisition system, we could collect that high-resolution image. 
And remember, the only reason that we're doing this slowly is just to collect basically more electrons from the sample. This device has three basic modes. It has the, the full video mode, which is approximately 30 frames a second. And then it has this scan rate, which is about 10 seconds for a full scan. And then it also has a super slow rate that's meant for use with the camera. And the full, the full scan takes about 60 seconds. And like I say, even modern cutting edge uh, scanning electron microscopes still require the same amount of time to collect a high quality image. Uh, just because the problem is actually physically based. It's just the number of electrons that we're trying to capture. So lucky for me, I have nearly the complete schematic for the whole scanning electron microscope and probed the board at the point where I get the video signal for these slow 10 and 60 second scan uh, readouts. The signal is quite high amplitude. We're at five volts per division. And you can see that there's a negative pulse here and a negative pulse here, which is what I'm triggering off of. And these are the horizontal uh, sync pulses. So between these two pulses, this represents one line of video or one string of values that we're pulling out from the scanning electron microscope. And as the scan moves from the top of the screen to the bottom, you can see the, the shape of the scan line change or the intensity of the scan line change. So the first thing we want to do is maximize the dynamic range that we can capture uh, with the oscilloscope. So what we're going to get here is eight bits of data uh, that are going to span the, top, the bottom to the top of the screen. So since we're, we're basically not capturing any signal from down here, what we can do is move the uh, horizontal or the vertical position down, and then I'm going to fine tune the gain, maybe not quite that much. Something like that. So now our video signal is basically filling up the whole screen, and it's okay that the sync pulse goes negative. Second, I'm going to go to the Acquire menu and change the uh, sampling mode to high resolution. Since we're going to be sampling at a relatively low rate, much slower than the scope can sample, we want to take all those values and average them together so that we don't get sampling noise. Next, we're going to change the record length. So since we know that the whole scan is going to take 10 seconds for the scanning electron microscope to finish, and let's say we want you know, a, a 2 or 3 megapixel image, or at least a 1 megapixel image, we're going to want to record at least 1 million or 2 million points. And so our options are 1 million or 5 million. And 1 million is probably not quite enough because we're going to lose some of those uh, acquisition points to the horizontal sync pulses, which happen pretty frequently. So I'm going to change the record length to 5 million. Right now, the scope is just triggering on every horizontal sync pulse that it gets. However, a slightly more elegant way of doing it is to set up the trigger so that it will only trigger on the vertical sync pulses, so that when the scope starts, or when the scanning electron microscope starts a scan, the scope will be triggered and will have the, the data at the right point. So instead of a simple edge trigger, I'm going to set up a pulse width trigger, and we are going to trigger when the pulse is greater than 500 microseconds. I actually like the data entry on this, since you can just dial in um, a number directly, like 500 microseconds, and just have it set like that. And if I set the level properly, you'll notice that it's actually not triggering. What's going on? Well, the, the vertical sync pulse is so infrequent, it only happens once every 10 seconds. The scope has gone into its auto trigger mode. So we'll change this to a normal trigger. And as you can see, uh, the scope is not running right now. It's a trigger with a question mark, meaning it hasn't gotten one. However, if you watch here, it's going to trigger now. And that was because the uh, microscope just started a new frame. So now all we have to do is set the horizontal scale so that we get this whole 10 second capture in one block. So we'll change the horizontal scale to uh, one second per division would be just not quite enough. So we'll go with two seconds per division. And then we'll also change the trigger point to be right about there. So at this trigger point, this is going to indicate the start of a frame. So the scope just triggered. And unfortunately, in the normal trigger mode with these very um, slow capture rates, you know, 250,000 samples per second, uh, it doesn't actually show you the buffer filling as it's acquiring data. So there it is. Um, this is a whole video frame. You can actually see the, the divisions. This is the start of the next frame. This is the end of the previous frame. And this is the whole frame. As you can see, there might be just a few very, very sparse peaks that are actually going off scale. 
but otherwise it's a very good image because we're using a, as much dynamic range as we can. So now we want to save this data to a file that we can get onto a PC. So I'm going to use my USB drive here, and the tech has an interesting feature. What we can do is set up the cursors to just select the data that we want. So what I'm going to do is basically just kind of give it some buffer, but basically just select that frame. And then we'll go to the Save menu and say Save Waveform. So we're going to save uh, Channel 1, and instead of saving it to R1, we're going to save it to uh, a file, and it automatically picks a name that doesn't exist already on the drive. And then for gating, we'll say Between Cursors. So we could have it save uh, just the screen or the full record, but this will actually save us some data since we don't care about uh, the other frames. I'll say OK. I'm using Octave, which is an open source MATLAB alternative to take the data in the CSV file and produce an image. So here you can see the horizontal pulses in the raw data. So this represents one scan line. And my script just goes through and puts those scan lines together, filling up the image in sort of a raster pattern. And so here we can see the image that we just captured. This is the MEMS gyroscope. And as you can see, there's actually a little bit of distortion at the side here, mainly because the scanning electron microscope does not intend for the video signal to be picked off the circuit board at that point where I grabbed it. So when you tell it to make a photo, what it does is it actually uses a subsection of the screen. In fact, just this middle, probably about the middle 25% or so. Here's an image of a house fly that I captured without actually coating the fly with metal. Typically, non-conductive specimens have to be sputter coated with metal to show up well. However, this is just a, a dried out fly. Here's a close up of the fly's eye and head area. I was also able to capture an image of red blood cells. This is just a tiny drop of blood that I put onto a metal holder and the blood cells are drying out but aren't completely dry yet. I was kind of surprised how much signal I got out of this. Okay, see you next time. Bye.